Good afternoon. My name is Peter Ryan. I'm the director of the Local Programs Bureau for New York State Department of Transportation. I'm here today to present the 2018 Combined Transportation Alternative Program and Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Improvement Program. Uh, it's an informational workshop. So let me go over a brief overview. Obviously, this is a 2018 TAP-CMAC program. We're going to talk about program eligibility and eligible sponsors, um, the evaluation criteria, how, how these are going to be scored and what we're looking for in scoring these applications, how do you apply for fundings. This is a federal aid program, so there are general federal aid requirements um, are, are part of this program. What resources are available to you? Um, there'll be the questions and answers, a break, and then the Grants Gateway overview. Uh, all the information contained in this presentation may be find, found on NYSOC website at the link noted on the slide. Please check back frequently as new information will be posted as it becomes available. The available documents are links to Grant, Grants Gateway training uh, uh, that occurs every Tuesday and Thursday. There's a list of workshops, dates, and times. There's a notice of funding availability. There's also a, a key program date in the 2018 guidebook, which is the Bible for how do you complete the program. Uh, in Appendix A, you get a list of all the RLPLs. Appendix B is all TAP information, sponsors eligibility, and project eligibility, uh, requirements and, and project evaluation criteria. In Appendix C, it's for CMAC information, the same criteria with sponsor eligibility requirements and, and uh, project uh, evaluations. Um, Appendix D is guidebook definition and terms. Appendix E is the application instructions. Appendix F is the 2018 TAP CMAC checklist, workshops, and forms. Um, and uh, also the pre-review request form, budgetary summary worksheets, and right-of-way documentation. Uh, the program objective, TAP-CMAC helps communities deliver safe, transformative, and innovative programs and projects that improve mobility, accessibility, including pedestrian and bicycle facilities, infrastructure projects, and improving non-driver access to public transportation and enhances mobility. Uh, the CMAC reduces emission, vehicle emissions and traffic congestions and these programs revitalize local and regional economies. Based on the feedback from the last solicitation, the criteria has been revised and streamlined. Uh, we're looking for match assurance documentation. That means a letter of intent or resolution. Um, we found in the past that sometimes after the project goes along, we don't have the support of the community. We know in the community there's uh, occasions where uh, legislative bodies change, so it's very important that we get some kind of assurance from uh, a mayor, a county executive, or a legislative board that we are on board with this program. Uh, both TAP and CMAC requires letter of community support. Once again, very important. You know, it could be a county legislator, it could be an assemblyman or a senator that there is support for this program. Once again, we've had pro uh, situations in the past where the, when it comes time to get this uh, the program in front of a legislative board, they don't, they, they don't want to support it, okay? So it's very important that we know that right now. Because I think the last iteration in 2016, we had 192 applications. We awarded 82. There was a lot of really good applications that didn't get it. So we're looking for, for projects that we know uh, that the community wants and can get delivered and built within a set amount of time. Um, uh, we also have found that the participating in the pre-review process benefits the applicants and makes for stronger applications. We strongly encourage participants to take advantage of this review. To encourage this, we're offering five extra points to anyone that attends a pre-review. So this is a very important, it could make or break your application. Similarly, there's five additional bonus points are offered if an applicant includes a letter from a professional engineer attesting to the deliverability of the project. Again, this helps ensure a successful, well-developed project. A question arose in the seminar yesterday about does it have to be from an outside uh, engineering firm? It's, if you have a, a PE working for the community or in the sponsor, that letter is okay. 
Finally, this year, all applications must be completed and submitted via the Grants Gateway. This is a state portal for many applications. For those not familiar with the Grants Gateway, additional information on what is needed uh, will be provided following the discussion. After this seminar, we're going to have a, a break, as I mentioned, and there will be a one-hour informational Grants Gateway that will be provided online. For this solicitation, there will be a total of $100 million available, $56 million for TAP statewide, $44 million for CMAC. Uh, the last iteration was in 2016. I think we offered 99 and we awarded 112, okay? Because we know some of these projects are going to fall out. So uh, that's not a, a good thing, but we, we expect to have somewhere in that, um, that, that range this time also. Uh, to be eligible for CMAC funding, the project must be located in one of the 19 counties that are listed up there. Well, there are other counties in the state that are eligible to use CMAC funding. These counties, New York, Nassau, Orange, Putnam, Rockland, Suffolk, and Westchester County are covered under a, uh, a separate process. The minimum award for per project is $250,000 and the maximum award is $5 million. The federal share is capped at the amount requested and limited to reimbursement for eligible items only. These programs are reimbursement programs, meaning that the sponsor will pay all projects costs first and then be, in, be reimbursed at 80% of the eligible cost. All eligible, all applicants must provide the 20% match. These projects are not eligible to use Marchicelli funds as part of the local match. There's other ways to do the local match. CHIPS funding is one that, you know, if you get a project where you're doing some work, you can use CHIPS as, as that. There's also some in-kind work, but that's got to get pre-approved by NISDOC to be acceptable. Well, the question is, in the 2016 um, round, uh, SAM funding was allowed to be used as the match. Um, I believe it still is, but let's get back to that. What we do, and there's another thing I should touch on is that there's a lot of, we have frequently asked questions that are posted on the website. There's about six pages up there now, so it would be helpful if you would review those. And we, we uh, gather them by every Tuesday and post them by Friday so that, but I will, we will get that for sure and post it on you. Okay. Uh, the next slide is important dates, June 1st to June 8th. We're right in the middle of that right now. We're going around doing the webinars and the workshops. June 8th is when the application pre-review deadline is due. Very important date. Like I said, it's worth five points. August 16th at 4 p.m., that's a hard date. That's the application submission deadline. Uh, at, at, after we get the applications in, we're going to re, they're going to be scored, they're going to be reviewed, and in late fall, we're going to announce the project award winners. There will be a kickoff meeting with your, local, your regional local project liaison. Uh, and then you prepare and execute a state licensing agreement, and then we're going to advance the project to construction letting within 24 months of the execution of the state local agreement. With that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dave McGowan, who is the RLPL in Region 9, a resident expert. Um, thanks, Peter. Um, again, my name is Dave McEwen. Um, I've been with the Region 9 DOT office in Binghamton for 24 years. I've been a local project liaison for 10 years, and I'm currently the regional TAP coordinator. So I'm going to cover aspects of eligibility, the evaluation criteria, consultant acquisition, and the application pre and final review processes. So every project must have an eligible sponsor, it must relate to surface transportation, it must meet the intent of the program and qualify under one of the categories of eligible project types for TAP or CMAC. It must benefit the public, and it must have documented community support. A project relates to surface transportation by proximity and connection to a highway or a pedestrian and bicycle corridor. It may enhance the aesthetic, cultural, or historic aspects of the travel experience. 
and it serves a transportation purpose rather than recreation. Um, examples of some ineligible items that you may have done under other programs include equipment purchases and buildings such as restrooms and visitor centers. Uh, additional ineligible items and work types are listed in Appendix B under the different project categories. Eligible sponsors for this solicitation are local governments, including counties, towns, cities, and villages, regional transportation authorities, transit agencies, natural resource or public land agencies, such as the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, or DEC, the State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation, local fish and game or wildlife agencies, and local or regional governmental agencies responsible for transportation or recreational trails. Now these are recreation agencies, but the project must have a strong transportation component. Tribal governments are also eligible sponsors, and for CMAC only, New York State DOT. Uh, sponsors submitting an application will be the responsible local official, the project manager, and the fiscal manager for all aspects of a successful or selected project. There will be more detail later on in the presentation regarding the sponsor's responsibilities and what those numerous project, as project aspects are. Uh, MPOs are not eligible, although they don't usually sponsor projects. And schools and school districts are not eligible. They must work with a willing and capable sponsor, agency, or municipality. Eligible TAP activities focus on non-motorized transportation, bicycles, pedestrians, non-driver transportation benefits and amenities, such as the design and construction of on-road and off-road pedestrian and bicycle facilities. Projects for improving safety and access to public transportation that enhance mobility. Turnouts, overlooks, and viewing areas on designated scenic byways or on National Register listed or National Register eligible highways. Conversion and use of abandoned railroad corridors for trails or transportation. Projects that make walking and bicycling to school a safe and routine activity. Specific requirements, project selection process, and the TAP evaluation criteria are in the guidebook appendix B. Recreational trails, although funded through TAP, is a standalone program, and it continues to be administered by New York State Parks and Recreation through a separate solicitation. Eligible CMAT activities focus on emissions and congestion reduction through projects such as travel demand management or ride share programs, but also park and ride, employee transit benefits, car sharing, bike sharing, and education and outreach. Congestion reduction and traffic flow improvements. Transit improvements, including operating support for new services. Great intermodal operational improvements, pedestrian and bicycle facilities, and development of alternative fuel infrastructure and clean vehicle deployment projects. CMAC projects must demonstrate an emissions benefit, such as the effect of the project on the number of vehicles, vehicle miles traveled, speeds, and vehicle operating characteristics, specific requirements, project selection process, and the CMAC rating criteria are in the guidebook in Appendix C. Um, now we'll talk about the application evaluation criteria, where the general categories are project benefits for non-motorized transportation or for congestion and air quality. Project alignment to the TAP or CMAC program, alignment with local and regional plans, projects, and systems. The essential project management elements, such as the scope of the project, including right-of-way, schedule, budget, uh, including your, your match funding your, and your match assurance. And as Peter said, and we'll stress several times, there are bonus points for a pre-review and a New York State professional engineer review. And again, those are both worth uh, 
they're worth five bonus points each, and the intent is to help you develop um, a better application. Um, this is a competitive process. So applications will be reviewed for eligibility and scored based on the criteria in the guidebook. Only applications submitted by the deadline will be evaluated. Incomplete applications will not score well. Ambiguity will not be interpreted in your favor. Um, so those are the general categories for evaluation. And some of the specifics vary by program, and we'll look at those now. The three categories for each program are the same. Project benefits, project alignment, and essential project management elements. <clears throat> but some of the details will vary. The most important component, as you can see, is the project management elements, which are worth 60 points the schedule, the budget, and the ability to deliver the project. All of the components of a successful application are included in the guidebook and the appendices. So please include all the necessary information in your application so it scores well. Again, the details for the path evaluation criteria can be found in Appendix B. CMAC has the same evaluation categories as TAP, except that for CMAC, you need to demonstrate that the project has air quality benefits. So the project benefits section is a bit different, and it's, that section is called project alignment and technical benefits. Um, it looks at the project's quantitative impact on congestion and air quality. In the emissions section for technical benefits, NISDOT will use the CMAC track air quality analysis program to evaluate emissions benefits based on the data that you enter with your application. Again, all the components of a successful application are found in the guidebook. Uh, details for CMAC are found in Appendix C. So now we'll talk about the, the detailed criteria within each evaluation category. The project benefits criteria are broken into benefits and proposed solutions. Uh, the project must address a surface transportation need, uh, may contribute to economic competitiveness, promote community connectivity, and again, must have documented community support. Uh, the project benefits will improve system efficiency mobility, accessibility, and modal connections. Innovation and creativity is an, another um, category in this uh, criteria. Uh, does your project have unique characteristics or new approaches or innovative techniques, cost-effective cost solutions? Does it leverage funding and does it re leverage relationships with, with other partner agencies? Does the project improve safety? It should reduce crashes, personal injuries, or fatalities, and address a high accident location. The evaluation criteria, the, the next criteria of project alignment, uh, will contribute another 20% of your project score. So a project is well aligned if it's referenced in a regional, state, or local plan, such as a comprehensive or master plan, corridor plan, scenic byway plan, Americans with Disabilities Act or ADA transition plan, an MPO plan, uh, a plan from your regional economic development council, if it's on or has a relationship to a designated bicycle route or routes, uh, or a local smart growth or complete streets plan. Uh, and you must identify these plans in your project application. The project is well aligned if it demonstrates a relationship to surface transportation and makes connections to the built environment, creating connections between trails, sidewalks to transit, community centers, or schools. The project enhances the trip experience improve safety, connectivity, or user access, such as ADA compliance. The project expands travel choices or improves access for the traveling public. 
the project meets the intended TAP or CMAC program purpose. For CMAC, there's an additional need to demonstrate congestion reduction and air quality benefits based on reduction of targeted pollutants such as carbon monoxide, ozone precursors of nitrogen oxides and or VOCs, and particulate matter. The major evaluation criteria are the project management elements of schedule, budget, and deliverability, and these contribute 60% of the score. All project phases and activities must be included in the scope, budget, and schedule, such as design, right-of-way acquisition if needed, environmental studies, regulatory reviews to meet federal and state requirements, materials testing, construction and construction inspection. The schedule must be realistic in relation to reviews, approvals, advertising, hiring a consultant, letting the project, awarding the project, and so on. The budget must be realistic and accurate for the scope in relation to the schedule. A right-of-way assurance is, should be provided, demonstrating that you understand that property, that you own the property where you want to do your project, you're leasing that property, you know that you need to acquire property, or you know that property acquisition is not needed. And additionally, with your budget is the match assurance and your ability to deliver the project by, by providing that documented um, commitment to the match and document your past performance. So again, we really recommend the application pre-review. Um, so worth five bonus points and should help you deliver a better application. So the next set of slides will cover general information, use and acquisition of consultants, application tips, and the review process. So some general points before we review the application. Um, as Peter already mentioned, new to this solicitation is the use of the Grants Gateway system to apply for TAP and CMAX funds, and more information on the Grants Gateway will be covered after this presentation. To be considered for either TAP or CMAX funding, all requirements for that specific program must be met, and those all those specific requirements are covered in the guidebook and the appendices. It's possible to apply for funding under both programs, in which case the project must meet both sets of eligibility criteria. Such an application will be evaluated twice, once against each set of program criteria and ranked accordingly for each program. But the project will receive funding under only one program. Applications um, will describe a single standalone project, that, that's one project per application, and the department may award up to two projects per sponsor. To clarify the use of consultants in application preparation and design, the original advertisement to hire any consultant needs to be clear on the scope of the work to be performed. So if you want the same consultant to prepare all or part of your application and provide consultant services for other parts of the same project, such as design, if, if your project eventually is awarded, that must be clearly stated in your advertisement. You may use the Local Design Services Agreement, or LDSA, administered by the New York State County Highway Superintendents Association. Consultants must be selected through a competitive, qualification-based, or QBS process. If you have an existing consultant contract in place, it must have been executed within the last three years. Sponsor may use its existing procurement procedures if the procedures meet state and federal procurement requirements. Um, to repeat the earlier guidance, consultants are only eligible to work on the phases such as application development, design, and or construction inspection that are named in the request for proposals or the solicitation. 
uh, see the local procedures manual, chapter six, section 611, regarding consultant acquisition. And if you're unsure of your, if your consultant selection process meets federal and state requirements, please contact your RLPL. Before you start your application, we have several tips. Please become familiar with the 2018 solicitation guidebook. Print out the application instructions in Appendix E and follow along as you develop your application. Um, I think we're going to go over that in, in more detail in a little bit. Um, gather all of your information necessary to complete the application. Become familiar with uh, the roles and uh, the system itself in using the Grants Gateway. Note the Grants Gateway number that's assigned to the application, and this is how NISDOT will reference the application when, when the reviews are done. Um, write an, any, any lengthy entries that you might want to enter into your application. Uh, write those in another application and, and cut and paste them uh, into, uh, into the appropriate section in the Grants Gateway system. Save your application often. Take part in the pre-review process and uh, as well have the PE review done. Um, it is your municipal grantee contract signatory or grantee system administrator who must submit the application by the deadline of August 16th at 4 p.m. with all supporting documentation uploaded. And when you do that, save and print the application for your records. So be sure that you know who your grantee signatory is. Do not wait until the last minute to try and figure out who's got the rights to, to submit your application. Um, this is the only person who can actually submit the application, although other people registered with your agency can, um, can work on completing the application. Oh, how many times do we put this in here? The participation in the application pre-review process is strongly encouraged. Um, your application number is required uh, to access your draft application. The reviewers can only consider the information submitted to date. Um, the review provides, will provide to you written feedback on the key components of your application. The process is not a substitute for actually completing your application and doing the submission. And again, sponsors must complete the application and submit it through the Grants Gateway no later than August 16th, along with all of the required documentation to be considered for funding. The deadline to Request participation in the application pre-review is June 28th. The pre-review request form is found on the TAP CMAC website uh, as shown on the slide. Uh, so you'll fill out that request form and email it to the TAP CMAC email mailbox at tap-cmac at dot.ny.gov. And this will trigger us to do the pre-review of your application. So when that's received, the regional TAP coordinator and other DOT staff will provide feedback on the project scope, budget, and deliverability risks. Um, again, we're, we're only going to be able to review what's in your application at the time that it's submitted for pre-review. Uh, you can continue to work on it after you submit that request, um, but it's limited to the application state up to that date. The feedback will be provided via, via a TAP CMAC pre-review comment form that will be emailed back to the applicant at the email address provided in the request no later than July 25th. This comment form must be uploaded with your final application submission if you want to have those bonus points added to your final application evaluation.
And now back to Peter, who will get into the details of the application. Thanks, Dave. Okay. Now we're going to talk about the application. The application, the instructions, and the worksheets that you will need to download and complete in the Grants Gateway. Before you can use the Grants Gateway, you will need to be registered in Grants Gateway and have an SFS, that's a State Financial System, vendor ID. Registration in Grants Gateway is required for any entity applying for or receiving state grants funds. This is a screenshot of the program-specific questions that you will see when you log in. Detailed instructions to complete the application can be found in Appendix E of the guidebook. The Grants Gateway ID and the SFF ID are required and must be included in your application. Do not wait until the last minute to identify your grantee contract signatory or grantee system administrator. While other Grants Gateway roles within an organization may start an application, the application may, may only actually be submitted by the authorized grant, signatory, or systems administrator. We'll, we'll talk on the next session a lot about that. Grants Gateway trainings are available biweekly via webinar. Go to the TAP CMAC webpage for information about these trainings. A major decision point in the application process is determining what program to apply for, TAP, CMAC, or both, and to decide on the project category. This eligible project category chart found in the guidebook in Appendix E will help you make this choice. Based on a selected category, your project may qualify for either program or possibly both. Keep in mind that each program has its own eligibility and data requirements. You can apply for funding under both programs, but if that is the case, you must submit and meet the requirements of both programs. Your application will be evaluated twice, once under each program. Detailed descriptions of TAP or CMAC eligibility categories, guiding questions, examples of eligible and ineligible projects, Specific requirements, project selection, selection process, and rating criteria are in guidebook appendices B and C. Review the guidebook and appendices for specific details to best select your category. While projects may fit into multiple categories, select the category that best describes the primary project purpose. Be aware the sponsor entity type and the project county may limit the categories available to choose from, particularly in the CMAC where we had mentioned that there are some counties that are non-attainment and some are attainment, so you got to be in the right county for CMAC. Other documents needed to complete the application are the detailed project budget estimate, the budget summary workshop, detailed project schedule, the documentation of community support, verification of match assurance, a project map, the right-of-way right worksheet and documentation, the CMAC technical benefits workshop, NEPA or seeker information, plans and drawings for the project, the New York State PE project review letter, and the NISDOT pre-review comment form. Some of these documents you will need to supply and others are provided in the gateway. If you look at the slide, the ones with asterisks are provided in the gateway. The other ones are, you can locate on the uh, TAP CMAC website. There are helpful checklists and required forms which are provided on both TAP and CMAC websites or the guidebook, Appendix F. Bolded items are the ones that are in Grants Gateway. First, the application checklist. This is a helpful list of what you need to be done prior, during, and just before submitting your application. The application pre-review request form. This form must be completed and submitted to NISDAC, NISDOT for application pre-review. The application pre-review comment form. This is a feedback form that you receive from NISDOT that must be submitted with the application to receive bonus points for participation in the review process. 
the budget worksheet summary. This is a required workshop provided to you in the Grants Gateway and must be included in your application submission. The right-of-way worksheet. This too is required worksheet if the project has right-of-way and is provided to you in the Grants Gateway and must be included in your application submission. CMAC technical benefits. This is a required worksheet for all CMAC projects and is provided in the Grants Gateway and must be also included in your submission. Uh, also, a sample New York State PE engineer project review letter. This is a sample letter of a licensed engineer uh, used if the sponsor chooses to have an engineer review. This too must be included in the application submission to receive bonus points. But we're really hitting on those bonus points, aren't we, Steve? Now let's take a look at a few more complex forms in detail. A very important worksheet in the budget summary works is the budget summary worksheet. You will need to first download this worksheet and save it to your computer and complete it using your detailed project estimate information. Information in this worksheet will be needed to complete other portions of the applications in the Grants Gateway. Applicants can find the budget summary worksheet within Grants Gateway or on the TAP CMAC website. The application instructions in Appendix E include complete and detailed instructions on how to complete this form. For now, we will give an overview of how to fill out this worksheet. Identify the anticipated cost for each project phase as you will, as you will, as you will fill out the top, of the, uh, the top left table. The bottom table will calculate. The lower table will then provide a range of costs that NISDOT would expect for these projects. If the value added is not within the range, the text will turn to red, indicating that you may want to look at the budget, budget item. For example, typically construction inspection cost is 10 percent, 10 to 12 percent of the total construction cost of the project. Reviewers are looking at these types of things during the recommended application pre-review. For construction projects, you should include an 8% contingency. That's 8% of the construction cost. That is why these two cells are highlighted in yellow. Ensure that you have the appropriate 20% qualifying match. TAP CMAC 20 can be reimbursed up to can be reimbursed up to 80% of the eligible project cost. You must be prepared to first instance or reimburse the funds. I mean, you pay up front 100% of the cost and request reimbursement of 80% of the eligible item cost. Note, right-of-way costs may account for no more than 10% of funding awarded and must meet all requirements under the Uniform Act. Describe all sources of other funds in the budget estimate. With approval from NISAC, eligible other funds may qualify as the local match. Here we show how the budget summary worksheet, um, worksheet works. And those areas where potential funding problems may become apparent jump out to sponsors and reviewers. You should be able to explain huge differences from the general norm. Project schedule. There's no specific format for this. You must upload this as part of the final application. Questions in the applications will let you indicate where you are in the project development process. This schedule provides additional detail for the reviewers. Projects must go to construction letting within 24 months of an executed state-local agreement through the Office of the State Controller. The further along a sponsor is with a project, the greater the chance to meet this schedule. If you have any additional project documentation, such as seeker, NEPA, or design approval documentation, you could upload these documents as well. Right away documentation. The ownership or control of the property required to implement your project is key. Property is owned, leased, or acquired. Easements, temporary or permanent, are included in this. Proof of any property is readily available. Proof that any property is readily available is important for project implementation. This ensures that your project can meet the implementation schedule for these programs. Proof of readily available right away, right away will receive higher scoring in the selection process. 
probably one of the biggest obstacles that we encounter in this program is right away. And everyone comes in and says, I shouldn't say everyone, but a majority of them come in and say, there's no right away or we have the right away, and somehow we find out that you know we need the right away. So that's very important. Some of the items must be completed at the time of the application. Others can be completed post-grants notification. Proof of right away may be in the form of highway boundary maps, title searches, or deeds. For work within the highway right away, roadway, or land that is publicly owned by another entity, the owner's support must be documented. For work within NISDOT right away, a highway work permit must be obtained by the time the contract is executed. This permit is submitted to the county residency where the work is to be performed and approved by the regional director. Also, roadways or land that is publicly owned or owned by another entity that owner support must be documented. All this is discussed in detail in the guidebook. If your project needs right away, you will be required to download, complete, and upload this form. More information is available in the application instructions. This form provides important information for the reviewer to understand what right away is required and where you are in the process. This is for CMAC projects only. All CMAC projects must complete the CMAC Technical Benefits Worksheet. The project category selection will determine which tables will need to be completed. See the application instructions for details. This shows you all the tables for your information only. Typical information needed for NISAC to determine the emission benefits include the number of motor vehicles affected for project, by the project, this is before and after project completion, vehicle miles traveled before and after, vehicle traffic average speed before and after. For clean vehicle and retrofit projects, the type of vehicles affected by the project, their average operating speed, and miles traveled before and after. The applicant is is responsible for estimating the project effects on vehicle volume, speed, and other activity data. The estimated, estimated effects must be credible and based on reproducible and logical analytical procedure. The applicant needs to explain and document the methods, models, or studies used to obtain the numbers supported in the charts. The department can't estimate the effect of your project on volume, speed, et cetera, in the application. It is up to the applicant to estimate these effects. We also recommend that sponsors refrain from exaggerating benefits in an attempt to improve the project score. For example, we would not expect the construction of a sidewalk to shift 10% of the single occupancy vehicle traffic to pedestrian mode. Be reasonable and estimate projects benefits based on reasonable professional judgment and appropriate traffic models. Specific data requirements, the project selection process, and CMAC project rating criteria are, find, are found in Guidebook Appendix C. With the information provided, NISDAC will calculate the air quality benefits used in the CMAC track program based on the United States Environmental Protection Association MOVES emission model. A project must demonstrate air quality benefits to be eligible for CMAC. Okay, after the application submission, um, please take a note of the application number. Also note that the application cannot be altered after you submit after you submit it. After you submit it, you can't touch it at all. And actually after that is submitted, uh, anyone from NISDOT can't comment it either. Uh, also, make a copy of your application. Uh, this is a federal aid program. Some of the highlights and the sponsor's responsibility. Uh, you must act as a primary project contact. You must manage the project. You must follow all federal aid requirements. Um, our department is responsible for uh, PLAFLAP, which is the procedure for locally administered federal aid projects. It's a very helpful tool. Uh, it's been said before that federal aid is not for the faint of heart, so you must follow all the requirements. And uh, I'll, I'll go I'll reach out there right now. If you have any questions, you can contact myself or Dawn, and uh, we'll get an answer about the federal aid because it's very it's a very stringent program, 
and um, something that they take to heart. Um, you also must enter into a state-local agreement with NYSDOT. You have to pay the project cost first, then submit the reimbursement request. We keep saying that, and it's very important. Bring a project to construction letting within 24 months of execution of a state-local agreement through OSC. Letting is also a bid. You know, we're trying to get these projects uh, to fruition. Uh, the last iteration, I think it was 18 months that we said. This time we went to 24 months because we know there's right away and some other issues. But any project that you have that's shovel ready is going to it's going to probably um, hold up well over the scrutiny of the uh, reviewers. Uh, also, you must have oversight of any work by contract or work performed by sponsor forces, and uh, the operation and maintenance of the project uh, upon completion. You know. Uh, your project, you must maintain it. Um, I mentioned earlier this is a federal aid uh, requirement. Thus, you know, you, you must comply with all the civil rights compliance, including ADA and DBE, uh, also all environmental documentation, NEPA and SEEKER, and you must, and, and there's post-project maintenance and operation responsibility. They are, you must maintain the facility for the life of the project. You must do all the repairs. If, if there's snow and ice removal required, you must do that. Uh, it is your, it, you know, it's your ownership, and it must maintain public access. It must be available to the public. Uh, it's supposed to be for 24 hours a day. There's been some concessions made on, you know, last iteration we had a, a trail that went through a cemetery and we allowed them to close it, but uh, in general it must be open to the public 24 hours a day. Okay, let's just review the reimbursement process. Uh, sponsors receive authorization to proceed. It's very important. You're not going to get paid if that doesn't happen. The work is performed. Sponsor pays the contractor, the consultant for the completed work. The sponsor supports the payment documentation to NISDOT. NISDOT reimburses the sponsors for the eligible costs. All right. Once again, the bills must be received in a timely manner. We want to reimburse you for work you have undertaken and completed. You, sub, you may submit reimbursement bills as frequently as monthly, and we encourage you to do that. A sponsor must receive an authorization to use the money before any work can begin. Once again, I stress that. That's very important. Uh, you know, sometimes you may think you can go out and do it, and all of a sudden, if it doesn't have authorization, you're not going to get paid for it. Uh, the sponsors also need to have the money to pay for the early costs of the projects and will only be reimbursed for eligible items. Inactive projects, their projects defined as those that have not submitted a reimbursement request within the last 12 months may be withdrawn and deobligated. I'm not saying that would happen, but it becomes under review. If nothing's happened and no bill has been submitted within 12 months, it becomes under review. And the Federal Highway wants to progress projects, and they, you know they're always honest to move projects, move projects. So send the bills in. We're, we want to pay you. Okay, uh, let's just review the total uh, the total uh, award. The federal share is 80 percent. The local share is 20 percent. Local force work, including in-kind work, must be in approved by NISDAC through a public interest finding. If you have any questions about that, contact your RLPL, Dave or John or whoever in your region beforehand, okay? This slide just has some uh, other federal aid guidance. Once again, I mentioned the PLOPLAP, the Procedure for Locally Administered Federal Aid Projects. It's uh, online on the NYSDOT uh, website. You can refer it. It's up to 19 chapters right now. Dawn covers everything from soup to nuts. And um, if you have any other questions about it, contact Dawn or I. There's some additional resources. Once again, the TAP uh, CMAC website. Uh, we have the guidebook and appendices, key program dates. There's training slides available. There's also estimating resources. So if you're looking to figure out when you're doing your budgetary thing, we have an estimating tool in the website where you can go in there and, and, and put your project down there, and it will give you uh, a, an estimate about the total cost that you can submit in the budget. And also the regional local project liaison. You can't keep, keep Tell you how invaluable those guys are. 
Uh, so here's some more additional resources, Federal Highways, um, the website there. If you want, if any questions and, and you can't answer it through us, you can go there. And there's a, an, a, another Federal Highway website there. Uh, the top takeaways we should from today's uh, workshop, you know, the due dates are very important. There's no wiggle room in there. The application pre-review, June 28th. The final application, August 16th at 4 o'clock. Uh, document and submit the community, community support. Once again, we sit there and there's uh, 192 projects last year. We awarded 80. We wish we could have awarded more. So make sure that you have support with the community. The bonus points for the PE and application preview, that's 10 points. That, that could put you over the top. Um, you got to bring a project to construction letting or implementation within 24 months of an executed, of an executed state local agreement. It'll take you a while to get that agreement done. We, you know, we, we'd like it to be done within three months. So you know, sometimes it takes to six months. So after that, you have 24 months to get it executed. And after that, you got 36 months to get it to construction completion. And all told, that's five and a half years. That's a pretty long time to bring a project, you know. So um, we're looking, once again, we're looking to get these projects done. They're, you know, they're great. The neighborhood loves them. The community loves them. And, uh, you know, whatever you can do to get these projects done, that's what we're looking for, projects that are shovel-ready and can get completed. Uh, also, this is a reimbursement program um, with a 20% sponsor match. Um, all applications we submitted through Grants Gateway, and there's only one project per application. You can submit more than one project, but only one an application. Don't wait to the last minute to get this done because there's a lot to, you'll, you'll see later on with Grants Gateway, there's a lot to these applications. First of all, we'll start with the Grants Gateway technical help. We have a help desk here in Albany, and it's manned from 8 to 4 every day. You can email us, call us, or visit the website. So email, you can see right there, grantsgateway at its.ny.gov. That's written in several of the documents you have as well. Uh, so is the phone number, 518-474-5595. And then you can go to the website, grantsreform.ny.gov, and I'll go to that in a few minutes. So a couple things about registration. I know some of these things you've heard already, but uh, we just want to reiterate and make sure it's clear. So all entities that wish to apply for grants in the state must be registered in the Grants Gateway. And this is a process that includes actually physically printing out something, getting it notarized, and mailing it into us. So uh, if you're not registered yet, it takes the time for you to fill it out and send it to us and us receive it. By the time we get it, it takes us only five minutes to get you uh, set up in the Gateway. Unless you don't have an SFS vendor ID, so your municipality would need to have an SFS vendor ID. If you've already done work with the state, uh, you probably have one. But if not, that's an additional two or three days to get that, to obtain that. So, you know, it's, again, one of those things we really don't want you waiting till the last minute or even the last week to do this. Uh, get started ahead of time. The websites that I referenced before, the Grants Gateway and the Grants Reform website, both have that registration form on it. And I'll show you that when I get to the system. Uh, one more thing about that, uh, you might hear the word pre-qualification or document vaults. That does not apply for municipalities, so don't worry about it. Um, that's a step that only not-for-profits have to do, and it's uh, fairly time-consuming, and uh, be happy that you don't have to worry about it as a municipality. So the Grants Gateway has access based on roles, and whatever role you log in as, you're allowed to do certain things in the system. What we do is we decide, uh, we let you decide who at your organization gets what role. And we do that by setting up this grantee delegated administrator. So what we do is when, oops, I didn't want blue here. We'll go with red. Um, when you fill out your registration form, you're filling out at least two names, and they are the people that will become the grantee delegated administrators in the Grants Gateway. Those are people that uh, can manage user accounts, and if you were a not-for-profit, you'd be working on the document vault. But really, they, for your cases, manage the user accounts. They can add, edit, remove people. So they can add people in any of these other roles. We've got here grantee. This is somebody who can start, save, and edit an application. So if you've got someone on staff who's filling out your grants, you can do that. If you have, for instance, a contractor or a grant writer that you're hiring to do it, you can assign them a role of grantee. 
Then you have to have somebody that can sign and submit an application. And that's these other two roles here on the bottom, the grantee contract signatory or the grantee system administrator. For your, for your uh, purposes, they do essentially the same thing. So they can, both of those roles can start, save, and edit an application just like a grantee, but they can also do this one extra thing that you really need, which is submit an application. So you need to have at least one person at your organization in one of these roles, we don't care which one, the grantee contract signatory or the grantee system administrator. So let's kind of go over those again. Uh, the grantee delegated admin, again, that's the person that can add new accounts, they'll manage your users. Your organization must have somebody in the role of grantee contract signatory or grantee system administrator because you need somebody to be able to submit the application. The role of grantee can only work on the application, can't submit it to us, and it is perfectly acceptable for one person to have multiple roles and thus multiple accounts in our system. Again, we leave it up to you to decide if you have a small organization and you are a grantee delegated admin and you're going to be the signatory, that's perfectly fine. Uh, we suggest if you do it, set it up using the same email address and even the same password. That way all you have to do is remember the different accounts, not different username, different passwords and, and things like that. Um, so it's, again, it's open to you to decide who has what access, but make sure you set it up before you get working on your applications. So the next steps, when we're done with this today and you want to get started, what are you going to do? What should you do in the gateway? So first of all, make sure that your organization is registered. Again, we'll look at the registration form quickly. Ensure that you have people set up in the right roles. So we just talked about that. And then I would make sure you download and read the RFA and all those other important related documents. You were shown the website earlier today, uh, the TAP CMAC website. I think Appendix E is really, uh, really well designed. If you follow that and in order that it's, it's written, you'll be in great shape in the gateway. So that, that shows you everything you need to do step by step. It's a really well written document. Then start your application. Obviously the sooner the better, because if you want to take advantage of the pre-review, you want to get that going and get as much done as you can before June 28th. Uh, so, uh, obviously that part is optional, but if you did do it, you would upload the pre-review comments form and all other required forms. You were, talked, you were told earlier about the budget and other documents that you need to include. So I'll show you when I do my application how that works. And then obviously submit your application in the Grants Gateway prior to the deadline. The act of submitting it is simply clicking two buttons, um, but you have to have everything done and prepared ahead of time. All right. So in respect to the application, here's how I would do it. So I'm going to say it here, and I'm going to actually do it when I show you the system. So I would first of all download all those required documents. Uh, and then I'd start the application. Now you have an application number, and you have access to the upload section of the gateway. And then I would go back to the application instructions, that attachment E that we're talking about, and look at all those questions. There's 60 questions that you're asked. And uh, I would formulate my answers in a Word doc or something like that. So that's number four here. Uh, you look at that instructions document, all the questions are there, and start writing your answers in a Word document or something, you know, some word processing program. That'll allow you to organize your thoughts. It'll be a lot easier to read than what you'll see in the gateway. And uh, when you post it into the gateway, or you could copy and paste it into the gateway, uh, it'll retain any, um, carriage breaks, you know, returns or bullet points or numbers. So it won't retain any formats like fonts and italics and bold, but it will retain um, kind of paragraph spacing and formatting. So you'll work on that. And you'll also work on the required forms out there, the budget and other forms that we talked about. And eventually you're all done with that and it's time to now upload things into the gateway. So put in your answers into the gateway and the program specific questions, put in your uploads, put in your budget. So essentially have a complete application. So complete all these application pages uh, and forms and then obviously submit it. You know, not shown in there is the, uh, the time before the 28th if you can to submit for pre-review. 
All right, so these are just a couple screenshots of some things just to familiarize you with what pages will look like in the system. Uh, there's a lot of things that are kind of multiple choice, and whereas the gateway doesn't allow us to create a multiple choice type question, the way we do it is this. So for instance, question five has these options. What is the type of uh, organization you are? So in this case, 5A is local government, county, town, city, village. 5B is a regional transportation authority, and so on. So if you're picking 5A, you would type 5A in the answer here. So it leaves you a text box to type in your answer, and you type in the answer based on the uh, code or number that corresponds to what you are, or to what your answer is. Some questions are text, some questions are dates, some questions are numbers. So eight and nine are numbers, and the instructions explain what those numbers mean. So I'll show you that when we get into the system. There's also upload pages. The Grants, uh, the grants Gateway in the Forms menu that we'll be working in has a, a page called the Pre-Submission Uploads. And in there is where uh, we give you templates that you can download and space for you to upload what we are asking of you. So it's kind of hard to read maybe on this small screen here, but this click here, that's a template where we've given you something to download, fill it out, and save it to your computer. Once you save it to your computer, you click this Browse button, find it, and once you hit Save in the gateway, it'll attach it. So that's how that works. And then the project budget. Uh, I was mentioned that uh, there's a project budget Excel sheet that you have to fill out. Well, once you fill it out, it'll give you some numbers that you can use to input into the gateway. Really, it's just your total project cost, your um, grant funds requested, and your sponsor match. Uh, but the worksheet helps you find out what fields to put in where. So up here in the top, is where you'll be filling out the worksheet in Excel on your computer. And then when you get into the gateway, this is where you're filling in those two sections I just talked about. So that's one line entry in the budget, and then you'll be filling out the split between the grant funds, the match funds, and other, which of course we probably don't have. All right, so this will show you the split between it. So there's really only two things you have to do in the gateway budget section. Uh, but the, the work is behind the scenes when you're filling out this spreadsheet that we've mentioned before. And then the last thing we want to point out here before we get into the systems is submitting the application. So again, that person in the right role, grantee contract signatory or grantee system administrator, need to log in, look at the application, and then there's a status change and they can change it to the status of application submitted. And when you do that, it gives you this agreement, says, um, are you, you know, you are who you say you are, you're allowed to sign on behalf of your organization. Um, there's something about MWBE, which we'll talk about later, but that doesn't really uh, apply to you because it's federal funding and the DOT will explain it better to you later. Um, but just, you're accepting the agreement. So you would click, I agree and you would submit it. So if everything was done and there was no problems, this act of finally submitting it is, you know, 10 seconds. Uh, but there's obviously a lot you have to do to get to that point. All right, so I don't see any questions typed in chat to me. Uh, and I'm going to now start sharing my screen and we'll get into the two websites I talked about. All right, so first of all, I'm at the Grants Reform website. This is grantsreform.ny.gov. And this is our, you know, kind of help desk website. Um, it is being actually redesigned this summer. I don't know when it'll be finished, but um, it will be a lot easier to use and, and have more information on it. But right now, um, there's really not much you need anyway here. And the reason for that is if we go to the Grantees tab, uh, what's here is on the top is the registration form, which you may need, but other guides that'll help you through working in the system. And then on the bottom here are links to pre-qualification information. So again, pre-qualification does not pertain to you if you're a governmental entity, so don't worry about it. The thing you would care about most is this registration form. Now there's a quick start guide for applications. I wouldn't even bother because that Appendix E or Attachment E that you have is so much more precise to what you'll be doing, so this is generic here. Um, you're not going to be working with contracts in the Grants Gateway, so all these other things you wouldn't have to worry about. What you would do is go to Registration Form here. 
So we can click on registration form. And this is the form. It's a two-pager. Page one is the information you need to fill out. Page two is the instructions. So your organization's name, your federal ID. If you have a SFS vendor ID, you could fill it out here. That helps us set up your account because that is, that is important. Everybody needs one. If you don't have one, you'll be asking for one. And we'll set that up and I'll show you what you need for that. Your addresses, the type of entity you are, and then remember I talked about the delegated administrators. These two names that you put in here will get the role of grantee delegated administrator. And when we get your registration form, we'll set them up. They'll get emails with their username and their password so they can start working in the gateway. On the bottom, your head of the organization needs to fill it out and sign it, and then a notary public needs to sign it and stamp it. So you're doing this on paper, you're sending it through mail, uh, the instructions are on the second page here, and the mail, the mailing address is right here. So this is the building I'm in right now. Uh, and we get it, and again, it takes pretty, it's pretty quick for us to process it unless you need an SFS ID number. And if you do, this substitute W9 form is what you need to fill out and also include with it. So include that, uh, another form you can click on, and I'll show you another way of getting that in a few minutes. So that was in the Grants Reform website on the Grantees tab and the Registration form. Uh, we talked about the calendar. I really wouldn't worry about the calendar. The training materials here, these are all generic for how to apply for a grant on Tuesdays and Thursdays. The 1131 is pre-qualification, which doesn't apply to you. But instead of going to the applying for a grant one, I would watch the video that we were creating from this webinar that we're doing here. So that's obviously more precise instead of a generic one. The last thing here is the videos, and there is a video for registration. That's really the only thing that would apply to you here on this page if you want some guidance with actually filling out and sending in the registration form. Okay, so that's again the Grants Reform website, grantsreform.ny.gov. Now let's get to the Grants Gateway. There's actually a link right here. Click here to access the Grants Gateway. Or you can type Grants Gateway .ny.gov. I want to point one thing out to people here. Let me zoom in a bit. I want to point one thing out, and that is a lot of people are in the habit of typing www when they go to a website. Don't do that. As you can see, you can get this, you'll get this result. It says this site is not secure. I can click on it and actually go to it, but you're on an unsecure version because the state, the way the state handles their secure websites is the certificate is not on the www version of it. So don't go to www.grantsgateway.ny.gov. Just go to grantsgateway.ny.gov. And I did that, and we're back in business here. All right, so I'm not going to log in just yet. I'm going to show you the portal. The portal is where anybody can access anywhere in the world as long as you have uh, an internet connection. And you can use it to register for grants, to be alerted of grants, and to search for grants. So the registration form that we talked about before, right down here in the bottom right, request access now. If you knew your SFS vendor ID, you could type it in here, and then it would tell you who your delegated admins are. And if not, here's the, S, here's the substitute W9 form, and here's the registration form, and it tells you to follow the instructions on that form. So that was the registration part of it. Notification, it's too late now for this one, but if you wanted to, you could sign up for, uh, to be alerted via email of any other grants that are posted in topics that are of interest to you. So fill out your name, email, and that information up top, and then select the type of grants you're interested in. For instance, if you were interested in public transportation services, you would have received an email when this grant was posted uh, a few weeks ago. So that's notification. And then finally here, browse and search. You can look for grant opportunities that are out there. So if I click on search now, I'm going to search for the TAP CMAC one. I could search on the agency. I could go to Department of Transportation and see everything that they have out there. And you can see there's a list of a bunch of things here. Some are closed. All the other ones are not in the Grants Gateway. The only one that's available in the Gateway right now is TAP CMAC. I could narrow that down, though. I could just type in TAP and hit search. And in that case, I have three results. Of course, the one on top here is the one we're talking about. So what does it show you? 
the name of the agency, the name of the opportunity, it's currently available, who can apply for it, the date it was posted on May 18th, and then the date it is due, August 16th. So if I click on this link here, I can find out a little bit more about it and uh, see what the, uh, the profile looks like here. So again, just remember, I haven't logged into the gateway. I've accessed the portal and I'm just searching. I'm not a user that's allowed to apply yet. All right, so grant opportunity ID. You were told earlier that you're gonna have a unique ID number for your application. It'll be this ID plus a five digit number. So DOT01-TCMAQ-2018-000025 or something, or 0025 something like that. So you'll see when I start my application, I'll have a unique application number. The agency is Department of Transportation. We know the name again, contact name, uh, paragraph about you know what it's about. And then on the right here, we have a couple of other lines of information. Right here is the link to the website. So again, if you need to get to that TAP CMAC website, which you do, here's another way of getting to it. Uh, I'll click on that in a few minutes. The application due date and time, again, 4 p.m. on August 16th. So we don't want you hitting the submit button at 3.59 and 22 seconds. You can, and if everything's fine, you'll be fine. But if you, you know, didn't realize that you had something that you forgot to fill out or something wasn't complete, uh, you'll get an error and you'll miss the deadline. So that deadline is not changing, and uh, the gateway is not forgiving for anybody who you know, waited to the last minute. So, you know, we, we keep pointing that out, but it's very important. People inevitably miss it and then complain about it, and we say, you were warned many times, <laughs> you know, and we can actually look at timestamps of when people actually worked in the system. Um, Q&A, that's also done on the TAP CMAC website. Who can apply for it? And then remember that email list I told you about. Anybody who had signed up for these three items would have been notified when this was posted on May 18th. So the two links here, view grant opportunity, if I click on that, that is going to be the RFA. So it's a Word document. Uh, it's you know basically going over the background, information about it, talks about TAP and CMAC. It'll provide links to uh, the website that we wanna get to. Uh, talks about funding availability. So I'm, you know, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but it talks about the evaluation criteria as well. How are TAP projects evaluated? What's the weight of each section? How are CMAC projects evaluated and the weight of each section? And then the last page is the links that we talked about. So that one link here is the most important is the TAP CMAC link. And that's up here in the announcement link. I can click on it and get to the website. So if I scroll down a bit, there is uh, the list of links and documents available to me. I'm not obviously gonna go through all of them. These were things that were explained to you during the earlier part of the presentation. Uh, but I will point out some things I'm going to use here. The application instructions, I've been referring to this application E, or I'm sorry, Appendix E. Certainly you need that. Again, if you follow this along the way it says, you'll be in great shape. Um, the other thing I wanna look at is, which one was it? Uh, the program, where is it? Uh, well, first of all, the pre-review. So your pre-review form is gonna be right here. I'll download this eventually and pretend to fill it out and show you what you need to do with that. And the most important to me is the application instructions and I would follow that. I'm actually gonna click it right now and we'll keep it up here as we're working. All right, so that was the TAP CMAC website. We haven't logged in yet. Let's do that and let's get into actually working on the application. So you would click on the login here and it would put in, you'd put in your username and password. Now I'm actually not gonna do it in our live system here. So I'm just gonna go change this and go to a testing system that we have. Okay, and you can see it looks the same. So we're not on the portal here. The portal is just for searching and finding uh, grants that are out there. We're on the login page, and I'll log in as somebody in the role of grantee. So I'm gonna be jgrantee2. If you didn't remember your password, you can click on forgot password, and it'll email you a temporary one to reset it. 
So I log in and it affirms that I am in the role of grantee and I'm going to just go over the uh, layout of the screen here first. So up on the top is searching. You can search the portal, which we already did. You can search for applications that your organization already has or has started. I'll do that in a little while. You can search for contracts, payments, progress reports. The thing you're really only going to use here is applications, and we'll do that in a few minutes. The black bar is kind of reference. You've got a link to some training materials, those documents I talked about before. Um, your organization, this is where if you were the delegated admin, you could set up the users, um, change, you know, add someone or change somebody or something like that. Profile is your personal profile. So this is where I could go in and change my uh, email address or my password or something like that. And then log out would obviously log you out. This blue bar, there's nothing here now except for show help. But uh, as we go through, we call this the action bar because on there will be the save button and add button and other things that will get you going, uh, allowing you to save the pages that you're working on. So I'm going to go from the bottom up here on this, uh, the main part of the page here. On the bottom here is my tasks. So I can see I have one task. And what I did before this webinar is I filled out an application or I started to fill out an application because there's, you know, so there's 60 questions that you have to answer, and I wasn't going to make you all sit through those 60 questions. So I've got them pretty much filled out. So if I click on Open Task, this is an application I started, application number 17. So DOT01, TCMAQ, 2018-00017, I'm application number 17. When you fill out your pre-review form, you'll give them this number. So I'm going to later on, I'm going to click on it and pick up where I left off on that one. But I'm going to start a new one from scratch to, to start with here. So that's my tasks. My inbox, ignore it. It has no bearing on what you're doing. It's only a copy of any email you might have received from the system. It doesn't let you do anything in the system. It just uh, is a kind of a holding place for those emails. But what you do want to do is this, view available opportunities. If you're a grantee contract signatory, a grantee, or a grantee system admin, you can go in here and view and apply for an opportunity. So I'll click view opportunities. It looks just like the search that we saw before in the portal, except this time I'm logged in in the right type of role. And I'll just search for the word TAP. And there's only one that it finds, and obviously this is the one we want. If I click on the link, looks like we've seen before, except for the button down here, apply for grant opportunity. So just to quickly go over that again, from the home page, I'm logged in as the right type of user. I go to View Opportunities. I search for it. In this case, I'm just typing TAP. I hit Search. I find it. I say, yep, this is the one I want. And I click on Apply for Grant Opportunity. Now, I mentioned I had already started one earlier today, so it's telling me I have one application in process. Remember, you were told you can start, you can have multiple projects, but each one has to have its own application. So if you did have an application started, I'm going to click on Apply for Grant Opportunity. It gives you a warning that says basically, hey, wait a minute, you've already started an application. Are you sure you want to start another one? And of course, I do in this case, so I'll hit OK. All right, so you saw that I had application 17 before. Well, now I've got application 18. So we're going to be able to copy and paste that into our review form in a little while. And what's new here is besides the navigation on top that you saw, there are these green buttons. And this is where you're going to be doing all the work of your application. So we start on the application main page. There's nothing to fill out on this page. It's just an overview. And that's where we, you click on the menu button. I know it says the word menu, but it's really the home page of the application. The forms menu is where we're going to do all of our work, though. So there's a whole bunch of forms, documents, pages in here that you need to work on. So we'll look on that. We'll look at that in a minute. Status change. This is where we'll eventually submit our application. Management tools. There's two things here that we'll talk about as we go through. And then progress reports and related documents. You can ignore that. Uh, those are related to if you have a contract in the grants gateway, and DOT is not going to be using the gateway for contracts. So we want to go to the forms menu. You could hover over it, but I'm going to click on it and see the whole menu here. First section, ignore contract document properties. 
Again, you're not going to be using the gateway for a contract if you were awarded one, so it doesn't pertain to you. Next section, application information. You can print the application. Ours is blank, so no point in doing it just yet. Another link to the RFP, another link to those that Appendix E, the uh, application instructions, which I already have open right here. And then application versions we will use in a little while uh, when we're done. This will be a one PDF that encompasses your entire application, all your answers to the questions, your budget, and any attachments you've provided. So the part where you actually have to start filling out your application begins here in program information in project site addresses. All right, so I'm going to click on that and start filling out my application. So this is going to be the Anytown Highway Department, and we're at 123 Main Street, and we are in uh, Anytown, New York. We'll call it Albany County, and I'll say my zip is 12345. Now you've got the Regional Council and Agency-Specific Region. What does that mean? If you're familiar with the Governor's Regional Economic Development Councils, REDCs, that's what this is. It wants to know which REDC you're part of. So if you don't know, uh, if we go to this Appendix E and we go down to the question or the section that we're on, so again, just follow this in order. Um, it talks about uh, help for the application, talks about the preview, the dates, and then it gets into uh, the checklist. Oh, that was what I was looking for before, I'm sorry. Uh, I was thinking it was separate, it's not, it's part of this. This checklist, you really should be filling out and refer to it before you're submitting the application. And then it gets into the actual logging into the gateway and finding the application like we just did. I'm going to scroll through here a bit. And project site addresses, there are links here to help you answer regional council and agency specific region. So if you don't know what regional economic De development council you're part of, click on this link here and it'll be brought to the guidebook on p and find it on page two. Uh, if you want to go to the, uh, if you need to know what regional office for DOT you're part of, click on this and you'll be able to find that out. So I'm going to go back to the gateway and I'll answer those two questions. I'm in the capital region and let's say I'm in Regional 1 Albany and I'll hit save. So that was easy enough. Um, when you save something, you get the green light. It says the page has been saved or the information has been saved. Um, I didn't miss anything that was required on this page. The required things are items with a red asterisk. Well, what if I didn't include something that was required and I tried to hit save? So it gives me an error. The project name description is a required field. The good thing is that I didn't lose what I've done here. It'll save partial pages. It just will never let you submit your application unless you've addressed all these required fields in the whole forms menu. So I'll put that back in, hit save, and this page is done. All right, so I'll go back to the forms menu. I could hover on it and click, or I'm just going to click on the forms menu and go to the next section. So I mentioned before about the timestamp. The forms menu shows who started it and at what time, and when was the last save made on that page. So let's go to the program specific questions. So the questions are here, and remember you were provided those questions in the application instructions document. So I'm back in the application instructions, and as I scroll down, here's question number one, question number two, all these different questions. So if I were you, uh, before you get to filling out the answers in the gateway, I would go in a Word document and maybe even print this out. You know, I'm, I always am against printing out things, but in this case, if you're 5A, you circle 5A. If you are a 1 through 11, we're going to put 11 or 1 or whatever it is, write it down here. And then the questions that require actual text answers, for instance, uh, provide a clearly defined, well-developed and concise project description. Include how the project relates to and addresses a service transportation problem need. You know, in your Word document, you would fill that out. That way, when you come back to the gateway, you can just copy and paste your answers here. Now, a lot of these you can type live in the gateway. It's not going to take you too much time. But my project title, it's going to be the Anytown Multi-Use Path. 
Salutation, Mr. First name, Jeff. Last name, Test. My title will be uh, Town Supervisor. So you can see, you can fill out the fields here. Your phone number. So I'm not obviously going to fill all these out and make you watch me do this. I've got one filled out, but I want to show a couple things. Um, first, I'm going to hit save here. So this is a page that has 60 questions. And a bunch of them are required, and it gives me this list of errors when I hit save that, wait a minute, you missed all these questions. That's fine, though. I can leave. I can log out. I can come back another day or later in the day, and I can pick up where I left off. It, you know, it'll remember the qu answers I put in. But there is a timeout in the Grants Gateway, and that was mentioned earlier in the PowerPoint as well. And the timeout is 20 minutes. So if I'm hitting, I'm sitting here, let me go to one that requires uh, text. And this allows up to 4,000 characters. And I'm sitting here typing, and I get a phone call. And uh, then I get up and go get a water or something. If 20 minutes elapses, it'll log me out of the system, and I didn't hit save yet, so everything I put in here is gone. That doesn't mean the things I've saved up on top are gone, because I've already saved them. But anything new that I hadn't hit save after, I would have lost. So save periodically. Every 5, 10 minutes is fine, but don't go longer than 20 because you could get logged out and lose, uh, lose what you've done. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to log out. Or I'm not going to log out. I'm going to go find that other application that I started earlier. So if I went to my home page and I went back to my tasks, now I have two tasks. Why? Because the one I started earlier today before the webinar and then the one I just started, 17 and 18. So that's easy enough. I could click on 17 and pick up with that one. But what if you're not the user that started the application and you don't have a task? You can go up to Applications and search for it there. So I could search for, uh, I could hit search on a clear page because maybe this is the only application I've ever done. Or I could go into a little details and search for the, the uh, letters TAP, and I can see, oh, yeah, I've got two applications started with TAP, number 17 and number 18. So I'm going to go to 17 because that's the one that's got more answers in it. So I'll click on that. I can go back to the forms menu, back to the program-specific questions, and in this case, I've only got two that I've missed. I'm just going to point out a few questions. Again, all of them are here in the application instructions document, Appendix E. But I want to point out how some of these work. So instead of the multiple choice, like I mentioned before in the PowerPoint, you're typing in a number or a code here that corresponds to your answer. So if I'm a regional local government, I'm a local government, I'm typing in 5A. If I'm a regional transportation authority, I'm typing in 5B. Number eight and number nine. Uh, they want you to have numbers that correspond to the category that best represents the project. Where do I find that? It's in those resource documents, but it's also here. This, you saw this in the first PowerPoint. Uh, when am I? Am, am I TAP eligible or CMAC eligible or both? So I can go down here and pick uh, the type of project I am and see what it goes under. Does it fall under TAP or CMAC? So I'm going to be in number one. I'm planning, design, and construction of infrastructure-related projects. So I put in one here for my answer to question number eight. Based on the type of project in county, um, what am I? Am I a only TAP, one, only CMAC, two, or both TAP and CMAC, three? And again, that's here in this table. And I put in a one because I'm TAP only. All right, so then you get into some of the text questions. This one allows for 500 characters. This one allows for 250. Uh, this one, 12 and 13, is latitude and longitude. So you would put in your coordinates there. So here's some more with answers. There's some yes and no questions. Some of them are if-thens. So for instance, let's find one um, where I put an NA in. So here's some answers that are numbers, another yes-no. Here's another one where it's a multiple choice or a, a select from below. So what is the status of my project? It's at 29D. It's in final, de final design status. 
Let me go find something I was, okay, so here's one. Uh, if I answered 31 as uh, 31A or 31D, not started or in process, I'd have to explain that. But since I didn't, I picked a 31C because I'm at environmental determination complete, I just write in NA. I have to write NA because with the red asterisk, it's a required field. So just putting in NA satisfies that requirement. So you have to type something in them if uh, it's related to your, your response, but if not, you type NA. Again, more uh, selection options here. And some of them have dates as well. This is a date picker that you've probably used on a website before, so very similar. So I've gone through and I've filled out all these questions, and I forgot to answer, or I didn't yet answer 58 and 59. And I'm doing that on purpose just because I want to show you what it's like to try to submit an application that's not complete. But let's just say I'm, for the sake of argument, I am done with this page, and I went back to the forms menu, and I now need to get into the next section, which is my budget. Now, I haven't yet filled out the budget worksheet, so I should probably do that. So I could get into here if I've already done it, but instead, let's get to that worksheet. So we can go to the pre-submission uploads, and this is where we mentioned earlier the documents that you're providing us as part of your application. Some of them we give you templates, like that budget worksheet. Click here to download the worksheet, fill it out, and then browse to add it here. So these are all the documents that uh, you need to provide. There's red asterisks for those that are required. Uh, the pre-review form, if you uh, filled it out, is not required because not everybody has to do it. But if you did get the comment form back, you would attach it here. And I will do the pre-review form. Uh, the budget estimate, so this is any format you choose, uploading your budget, but then you're actually filling out the budget worksheet, and that's what I'm going to do here in a minute. Your project schedule, community support. If you have multiple items, there's a couple ways of handling them. One is you can only make one upload per line here. So if you had multiple items of community support documentation, combine them all into one PDF. But on the bottom, we do give you a couple other spaces here, five other spaces for other things you might need to upload. So you can put that there as well if you've kind of got some overflow of, of information. We don't want, you know, things that are well beyond the scope of what we're asking for. We don't want your project, it, it's not better because it's longer, it's better because it's got the included things that we require and it's uh, easy to understand. All right, so I am going to download this budget worksheet. Now, in this test system, I can't just click on it because it'll give me an error. You would just click here and download it. I just have to copy the shortcut and uh, fix the address here. So you wouldn't have to do that. You would just click it, and you would get this uh, Excel download. I'm opening it, and I'm enabling editing. Zoom out just a little bit here and I would fill out this form. So I'm not going to, uh, it's pretty self-explanatory, but this is where you fill out your budget and you'll come up with your total project cost, your funds requested, and your match. Okay, so uh, those things are going to be plugged into the Grants Gateway. So I've filled this out, I've saved it. It's probably a good idea, after I just save it, to go here, back to the Gateway, go to the uh, where is it? To the budget summary worksheet, click on browse and attach what I've done. Now, obviously, I haven't done it. I'm just going to take a sample PDF here and upload it, but you would have the real Excel that you're putting here. So if I hit save, it gives me errors because, of course, I didn't do all the required documents here, but it does say that I've uploaded the worksheet and I could click on view file to see what I've uploaded. So we'll get back to this page in a few minutes. Let's go back to the budget uh, because let's say we just did the budget and I want to go here into the capital budget and fill it out. There's two things you have to do. There's a line or a category called other and you're going to go to the other category. And if you were following along in the application instructions, I'm going to scroll way down to there. There's a budget section here. It tells you to go to other and it tells you to type in your project, uh, your type description, total project cost. So I'm just going to do what the instructions tell me and write total project cost. 
Okay, easy enough. And then the only other thing that's required here is the total cost of my project. So let's say I have a $1 million project and I'm going to have $800,000 in grant funds and $200,000 in match funds. So I'll type in 1 million here and I'll hit save. So that's all you need on this page, the words total project cost and the actual total project cost. All right, I'll go back to the forms menu, back down to the budget section and to capital summary. And if we were following the directions in the application instructions worksheet, uh, it tells us what to do here as well. And what that is, is go to capital summary and write the split of the two sections. Grant funds, remember I said I had 800,000. No, nope, not 8 million. And match funds, I had 200,000. And nothing in other funds, obviously 800 plus 200 equals 1 million. If I hit save, everything's good. P information's been saved, it adds everything, everything adds up right, and we're good. What if I made a typo here? What if I even made it off by $1? 200,000 and $1, and I hit save. It gives me an error because it knows 800,000 plus 200,000 and $1 does not equal $1 million. So I would never be able to submit my application unless these numbers match. So again, that budget worksheet in Excel will help you come up with these numbers and you're going to input them into the gateway and you're going to upload your completed worksheet into the uh, pre-submission upload section. So that was the budget. Let's go finish that section, the pre-submission uploads. All right, so there is uh, the pre-review comment form. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Your detailed project bu budget estimate. I'm just gonna, again, grab a random PDF. You would have a real document. My project schedule. Community support. Verification of our match. Project map. So project maps may be very large. Uh, we definitely would prefer it if you made them a P, uh, PDF. Um, the system does allow for image files, uh, but PDFs usually work better. And uh, Excel, Word, those documents work perfectly fine as well. So your attachments are hopefully only gonna be really Excel, Word, and PDFs. All right, so I have my project map, I'll attach it. Um, let's say I don't have right away documentation, so I don't need it. Um, just going to skip some things that are not needed. Seeker, project management plan, let's say I have one, I'll go here. I've got some plans and drawings I want to provide, I'll attach that. Again, don't take more than 20 minutes without hitting save. Let's say I have a PE review, and in fact, here's a template for that as well, for a PE review form. I'll hit save and I get the green light, all my information has been saved, and I can see, if I click on view file, all the things that I've attached. Now this is just a sample attachment. So that's important though, because you wanna make sure that what you uploaded is really what you intended for that question. If you put in uh, the wrong document here under budget summary worksheet, we don't get it, and you know that's going to affect your score on your application. So you do need to verify that what you uploaded to this line is what you really intended to upload. Okay, so let's say, remember the date of June 28th, that's when the pre-review needs to be done. Let's say we're before that date, we're June 25th, we've done as much as we can in our application, we wanna have somebody at DOT take a look at it and evaluate it. All right, so I want to get that pre-review form. If I go back into the TAP CMAC website, and I go down here, and the form is right here, the pre-review request form. So I'll click on this, I'll open it up, and I'll fill it out. Any town, highway, department, what's my application number? I'll go back into my application, and it's right here. I'll go back to Word and paste it in there. My region, I would fill out 
my project title I'd fill out, and then I would send this email, I would save this, and send it to the tap-cmac at dot.ny.gov address, okay? And it asks you to include the application number in the subject line. So pre-review for application number blah, 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 17. All right, so I send that out. A couple days or weeks or whatever goes by, and I get the response from DOT, and maybe there's some things they want me to change. So I can go back into the system here and realize that, you know, maybe I provided, uh, I didn't provide enough information for my map or whatever it is they're telling me I need to do. You can go in and make your changes. You haven't submitted your application yet. You're before the deadline. So this is sometime after June 28th, uh, but obviously before August 16th. Um, so I'll make my changes. You know, it's no problem to go into any of the other pages we've already looked at and make our changes. Um, but when you get that, you do want to go back to the pre-submission uploads and upload the form that they send you back. So it's not going to be the form that I just filled out. It's going to be its own form that gives us the guidance and tells us that our application has been pre-reviewed. So I get that, and I'll attach it, and I'll hit save. And that will assure that I get that five extra points if I'm doing this uh, before June 28th. All right? So... Um, I think I'm done with my application. We know that I'm not because I forgot two questions here, but we're going to pretend we don't notice that. But remember, I'm not the person that can submit my application. I'm a grantee, so I need to be, uh, either I need to be or I need to give it to somebody in the right role, grantee contract signatory or grantee system administrator. So that person could just log in, go to applications, search for this application, and pick up with it. Or I can give them a task if I'd like. Um, this way it just makes it easier instead of them having to search. If I'm in the application and I go to Management Tools, Add Edit People, I can find their name, and the person I'm looking for is Jeff Signatory, and I can hit Save, and when he signs in, he'll actually have a task now that he's assigned to it. So again, that was in the, in the application itself, Management Tools, Add Edit People. What does Management Tools Check for Errors do? or check global errors up here, it looks to see for any fields that I missed that had required fields with red asterisks. I'm going to ignore, I'm going to ignore this, but you should do that before you submit it. So let's log in as that person that can submit my application. That's going to be J Signatory. And he logs in. And as we uh, should expect, I have a task because I was just given the task. So I could click on Open Tasks, click on Application 17, and work on it. Or I can go up to Applications, search for Tap, hit Search. Of course, I have two of them. One of them is assigned to me. The other one wasn't. But I want to do number 17, so I'll click on that. So I'm back in 17. So. I strongly suggest you have at least two sets of eyes looking at it. Um, the person that filled it out, and now this other person who's going to submit it. So I could go through here and go page by page, which we just did, and hopefully this error would have stood out to me. Uh, or you can click on this print application. So this is not exactly elegant, uh, but what it is is essentially, I'll hit the cancel button here. Um, it's a, lay, it's a linear layout of all those pages we just went through in order. So the address, the answers to the questions, and even those that have a lot of text, you know, some of them with text, I would see all the text here. So there's all the answers to the questions. Here is the budget. So here's one with a long answer right here. But some of them could span, you know, more than a page. Um, here's my budget, the $1 million total project cost, uh, the split between 800 and 200, and here's the uploads. Now, it doesn't actually let me click on the uploads I've provided. It just says that I did something here. So again, if you want to double check your uploads, the real only way to do it is go to pre-submission uploads in the forms menu and click on the view file. So I do strongly suggest you do that. Uh, just as a final check before you submit your application. All right, 
But I'm done. I, um, I'm done with my application, and I'm ready to submit it, and obviously it's before the due date of August 16th at 4 p.m. Um, I want you to notice one thing is the status. So our application is currently in the status of application and process. That'll change when I submit it. So let's try to do that. We know it's not going to work because I'm going to have an error, but if I do status changes, application submitted, it says, wait a minute, you still didn't fill out question 58 and 59. So if I was doing that at 3.59 and 22 seconds, I probably don't have enough time to actually do it and then get back before the 4 o'clock deadline. If I had 20 errors, that would be a, a lot bigger story. So again, you know, we've said this many times, please don't get yourself into the position where you're doing it at the last minute and you're running out of time. We don't want to deny you because of that. So I click on program specific questions, I go down to 59 and 58. 58 was, did, was it submitted for pre-review? Yes, actually it was. Did I upload a copy of the pre-review comment form in the pre-submission pre -submission uploads? Yep, I did. Did I have a PE review it? Yes, I did. Did I upload the copy of the PE uh, in there? Yes, I did. So I'll hit save. So now I've answered 58 and 59. Now I'm really done, and I'm now really going to submit my application. So again, we're in application in process right now. I'll go to status change and apply that status of application submitted. And I agree to that agreement we talked about before. And it processes. And we're done. So my application is now in the status of assignment of reviewers. All right, and that's where it'll sit until 816 or 817 when they start looking at these applications. So one last thing that happens, or, or a couple things here. How do I know that I submitted my application? So number one, it's in that status of assignment of reviewers. Number two, I will receive an email that says, congratulations, you submitted this application. And number three, a little more subtle, is I don't have that task anymore. If I went to home and looked at for my task, I don't have any tasks, so it doesn't even show here. So uh, three ways. The status changes, you get an email, and you no longer have a task. Now I can still search for it. I can go to applications, search for tap, click on number 17, which happens to be an assignment of reviewers. I can look at any of the things I've done, but I can't actually save any pages anymore. If I go here to program specific questions, there's no more save button. Now, if you did submit it and you're well, be, well before the deadline and you realize you wanted to change something, you could call our help desk and we could send it back to you uh, with the understanding that it's now unlocked or unsubmitted and you need to resubmit it before the deadline or it won't be considered as submitted. So, you know, that's kind of a last chance to change things. Hopefully you'll be submitting it while it's completed though. All right, one last thing, and that's if we go to the forms menu, there is going to be a PDF created here in application versions. If I click on it, there would be a version here, it would be version one, submitted by my name, the role that I used, um, and a link to the PDF. So it takes about five or 10 minutes to do that. So we're not gonna sit here and wait for it. I did one yesterday, I'll just download, I'll just show you that one. So this is what it looks like. Obviously this is not application 17, this is application 14 that I did yesterday, but it's pretty much the same. Page one, I'll zoom out a little bit here. Page one is the cover sheet, your name of your organization, your application number, what you called it, when you submitted it. And this is the one I did yesterday. The amount you're requesting, Page two is who submitted it, that's who, we, who signed it. Page three is the addresses. Page four is where the questions and answers start. So here's all the answers that I provided when I did this webinar yesterday. Here's a longer answer in number 15 and 16 and so on. So it's you know getting to be quite a few pages here. All the questions and answers I've made. Okay, after the uh, program specific questions is the budget. And you can see this is a landscape page. So if your maps that you're included are landscape and huge, it works out pretty good. It, it uh, will correctly orient them. And there's that category of other that I filled out for 800 and 200. 
there's my total project cost. Next is the work plan, and you'll see that it's blank. If you remember, we didn't do anything called work plan in our application. So this is a part of the gateway that DOT is not using. So you wouldn't have seen it in the forms menu, but you'll see it here. Just ignore these next three pages. Work plan summary is going to be blank. Work plan detail is going to be blank, and the organizational capacity will be blank. That's fine. And the last part of it is all the attachments we made. Now, I just made nine attachments or so, and they're each one page, and there's really nothing on them. Yours would obviously be the Word docs, the PDFs, the spreadsheets, the maps, anything that you've uploaded here. So, you know, I'm only a 30-page document here. Yours may be well over 100, and that's perfectly fine. So just realize the order in which you're going to see. And let's see if I've talked long enough to see if the actual one appeared here in application versions. And it hasn't yet, but again, uh, to get the application that you submitted, you would go back to the forms menu of your application, go down to application versions. We'll know when it's been submitted when there's a little icon here. You'd click on it, and then you'd have the download link right here on the right. 